Why does Boston Market taste so good? <laughs> salt. It's mostly salt. It's that, mostly salt. It's 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 food that got onto a plate of salt. <laughs> yeah, look, your tongue isn't supposed to be bleeding after you eat ham. That's just that's just that, that's just the generosity of, uh, the, the, of, the, of mashed the salt. Potatoes, the mashed pota- potatoes aren't supposed to be crunchy. Right. <laughs> You know what that is? It's salt, baby. Neither is the water. And but you can't get enough. You can't you get can't, enough. You can't get enough. And you know what else you can't get enough of? What? Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to Pixlet. My name is Kevin. With me as always is Phil. Hi. And today we're starting oh. a brand new book. Oh boy, here we go. It is digga, 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 digga. Halo. Outcast yes. by Troy Denning. Yeah. 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 And you might be asking, like, whoa, this game, this, this game, this book is not even out yet. And you're right. It's, it's true. Not even. It's it's gonna be out in like a couple days from this first episode. Mm-hmm. And um yeah, we're reading it early, uh, courtesy of the publisher. Yes. Yeah. Full so. disclosure, uh, Gallery Books contacted us and uh, and asked if we would like to cover this book on our show. Uh, and uh, we're not being paid for this, but we are also, you know, this is this is something that was provided to us early. Uh, gratis. Gratis. So, Look at this. Yeah. Look at that. We got we got right. some early ARC copies and. Uh, yeah. So all of the now to be fair, all of the nice things we're going to say uh, are, are still our genuine feelings. Uh, but, still uh, genuine feelings. It's yeah. just you know what I love is when we get something for free and then we we can say nice things about it. Yeah, because yeah, the opposite would be terrible. We have spent we have spent money <laughs> on things that we hated. <laughs> and 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 so far, the things that we've gotten for free have been pretty good. <laughs> so yeah. it's yeah. It may, so if if you think that we can be bought uh, with a couple of free uh, advanced uh, novels, uh, I mean you're kind of right, but not really. Like we're still gonna you know we're, we're gonna say it's what we mean. Just a little bit right. We're still yeah, a little bit right. Yeah, you're, we're still. Where'd the spoon come from? I don't. Um, that was a. <laughs> It's a random implement you just brought out of nowhere. Just, there is no spoon. I, I, I thought I, 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 was, I was grabbing like a pen. Um, <laughs> just emphasizing your point with a pen, and it turned and out to be a spoon. Like, it's just like, uh, you know, a pen makes sense, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, sure. But a spoon doesn't really. Anyway, we can be bought. That was the point. Uh, you we know can how we be. can buy us. Where's a website that somebody can go if they wanted to buy us? Oh, let's say that you guys wanted to buy us. I would recommend, first and foremost, patreon.com slash pixelitpod, where you can join up on any number of one of three tiers or actually a fourth free tier. Am I correct in that, sir? Yeah, yeah. You can go ahead and just become a free member. And, yeah. you know, you, that's an easy way to follow us. Yeah, be if a part of the community. Be a part of the community. If you don't want to be on the social media anymore, and I understand you. And I get I it. I totally understand. Mm-hmm. Uh, an easy way to, to follow our updates is use the free membership option on Patreon. Absolutely. Do that. Follow us around. And that is where we post a lot of our bonus material, including... As of the recording of this, our first two episodes of our deep dive into the 1989 cartoon series, The Legend of Zelda. Uh, And by the time this comes out, we'll have had four episodes out. I I think, yeah, we'll have been all the way through The Legend of Zelda and and into uh, 1997. Yeah, exactly. So we've got bonus stuff coming. Uh, More stuff than you can shake an angry spoon at. Uh, Yep. There it is. Yeah. So please check out patreon.com slash pixel lit pod. Do it today. Do it today. The spoon commands you. Please don't uh, don't right. anger the spoon. So, Phil, um, you just did the Patreon shill, so I'm going to give you a break. And okay. talk a little bit about what, uh, if you don't know, the book is based on Halo, right? This is our mm. fifth. Well, how many Halo books have we read? This is Five? our fifth, I think. Yeah, fifth. Okay, yeah. <laughs> right. it's 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 absolutely the franchise we've covered the most. And but honestly, of everything we've touched, it's the franchise that has the most material. They keep yes. pumping these books out. It, so. it has the most material. We are going to be covering Halo for a while. Yeah. Um. So Halo Outcasts, 
there's a note at the beginning. It takes place before the events on Halo Zeta, which means it is taking place before the last book that we read, which was Rubicon Protocol. So mm -hmm. Rubicon Protocol, which was released first, hasn't happened yet. And Rubicon Protocol was the direct prequel story to Halo Infinite. Yes. Halo Outcasts, meanwhile, the two main characters are uh, Thel Vadam um, and, and Olympia Vale, right? Mm -hmm. Who are characters uh, Vadam has been in, and I'm sure I'm saying that wrong because there's apostrophe, an apostrophe in there, but Vadam has been in a bunch of other of the Halo games. Uh, he was in charge, he was, he was in, char the, in charge of the fleet that glassed Reach, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Olympia Vale was from Halo 5. She was a character in Halo 5. This book more or less bridges the events between Halo 5, in which Cortana basically becomes an evil tyrant overlord, mm -hmm. um, and the events of Halo Infinite. So this is kind of like that that gap in between. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's where that's where we are in terms of what video games is this based on? It's based on that space between Halo Five and Halo Infinite. Yes, yes, and this is part of a standalone series anyway. So right. it's, it's uh, this one isn't part of any of the trilogies, any of the series is is is. So you're able to hop in there and just go, uh, which is yeah. I, by the way, everything I just said. I looked up some of it, but most of it gets explained during the course of yeah. the book. So you, you don't have to know, uh, as long as you're familiar with like the concept of Halo, the video game, you don't really need to uh, know a whole lot because uh, unless you, you're afraid of getting spoilers on mm -hmm. the games that you haven't played, right. um, you don't have to know a whole lot. They, a lot of it gets, you get caught up easily. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. So who's Troy Denning? Oh, Troy Denning, you ask. I, I gotta tell you, I, every time we do one of these, I, I I look forward to looking up the authors here because there's that feeling of like, I don't always know the names of these guys and there's always something crazy surprising and exciting uh, that I find out like, well, not always, but a lot of the times. And this is one of those times. Uh, Troy Denning actually started his career as a game designer in 1981 for TSR. Wow. Uh, yeah. This guy is old school. He has got... Well, did he work on Dungeons & Dragons? He worked or? on Dungeons & Dragons. Not only did he work on Dungeons & Dragons, he co-created the Dark Sun setting, which is one of my favorite settings. Wow. Yeah. He worked with Brom. He worked with Tim Brown, Mary Kirchhoff. He worked with a lot of, like excellent legends within this would have just uh, been thing. advanced dnd right that he worked yeah. on right yeah yeah because uh, first edition is 70 something to because yeah yeah this would have been this would have been advanced second edition which is I, second it, edition I yeah forget. it gets very it gets very i forget the years for but me. yeah yeah no but he he worked on some really cool original stuff for game design and while he was doing that and after he was doing that, he he wrote, uh, let's see, he wrote five novels for the Dark Sun series. Uh, he wrote about over a dozen Forgotten Realms novels. Wow. Um, he has written, this is his seventh Halo book, and possibly the thing that he would be best known for is he wrote about a dozen Star Wars books. Uh, wow. Books that are all now, I believe all of them are now considered in the uh, what do they call that the legends oh the legends canon yeah, yeah. which is whatever but he he wrote the swarm war and tatooine ghost and a few of these that i have absolutely read uh and it was really cool to to, to uh see them put up again so this guy has worked on some big damn franchises and uh has yeah. really left his uh his thumbprint on them and it's really impressive to me because he is he's he's up there with Alan Dean Foster and some of the other old school fantasy writers that we have talked about um, who laid a lot of groundwork, but were very much of their time. Uh, but as we're going to get into with this, Troy Denning is an exceptionally modern writer. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so it uh, finding out that he wasn't just some up and coming guy that I just I've actually read read his work before. Uh, that he is old school as shit 
uh, made all of this that much more impressive. Uh, right. It's really cool. And um, sometimes we say modern versus old school, and mm. it's not necessarily a, uh, a, it's not a detraction against the older old school writers. No. I think usually when we say that, it means that a lot of times modern writers, especially in science fiction, have a little bit more, uh, they tend to layer in other genre tropes or other genre tones into the science fiction, if that makes sense. Yeah, sure. Um, so like Halo Outcasts is very much, uh, it's almost like a, it's between military and political thriller, you yeah. know? Yes, it's, I, it, yeah. know? <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more. I think, I think that's it. And that's what's funny is whereas the old school writers, it's it, an old school fantasy novel is, is far more straightforward, it's simpler. Sure. It's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a dungeon crawl. Who doesn't like a dungeon crawl? It's awesome. Um, whereas, and that, but that's been done so much that modern writing tends to, like Kevin said, subvert it a little bit by adding some other elements to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, it, it it tends to be a little more complex and that sort of thing. Yeah, and for a lot of people and for a lot of writers, that means that some people read it and roll their eyes and go, "Jesus Christ, just tell a fucking story." Um, but when it's done well, that's where you get your Game of Thrones. That's where you get the big classics. And uh, Troy Denning has skirted both sides sure. of that aisle. And I find that really impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, being a big, being somebody who had such an impact on the fantasy genre, um, not only writing all those those D and D books, but mm -hmm. but his work with the game itself. Yeah, I mean that's a huge impact on just the genre to begin with, and yeah. then also then jumping over to science fiction is is a pretty interesting. Um, it, it's something that you don't see that often. You know, no, you don't people see tend to stick to one or the other. Right, exactly. So obviously, there's exceptions to all these rules, but just saying it's. He seems like a seems like a, he's had a neat career, you know. Yeah, yeah, he, he really has. It's really it's a, it's a very if you get a chance, guys, check out his bibliography. It's pretty impressive. It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So as as we do though, uh, no matter how much we like the book or dislike the book, the only thing that happens next is we got to put the body in the marsh. Let's let's do that. Let's put that dang old body in that dang old marsh. <laughs> I don't believe it. What can't you believe? I spent all fucking night dragging the poor bastard in there. Uh, okay, so Halo Outcast by Troy Denning. Uh, as I mentioned, it starts with a historian's note that it takes place right before uh, the events of ha on Halo Zeta, uh, the Halo. Uh, so that's Rubicon Protocol and Halo Infinite. Chapter one. Uh, is told from the point of view of Arbiter Thelvadam, who is considering how to handle the Kaidons, who are kind of like the governors of the Sangheili in order to unite them. I just said a bunch of words that <laughs> you don't get yet. Uh -huh. <laughs> if you're not like, if you're not into the Halo stuff, the Sangheili are the are the ones that are are were the enemies in the game who are normally called elites. Mm -hmm. Um Arbiter Thel Vadam is like he's like the president of the Sangheili, but he has not much power. Yeah. <laughs> he can't do a whole lot. <laughs> he's stuck in stuck in bureaucratic hell, basically. And there's a bunch of the Sangheili have a bunch of different worlds that they that they occupy, and each world has like a kaidon, and that's that's a governor. Yeah, and he he's basically like, what am I gonna do? With with these with these folks, you know, saying the Sangheili aren't very united. They have all these different factions. Um, he, Vidam was once a high ranking official in the Covenant. Um, now that the Sangheili and the humans are allied, he's doing his due diligence to unite his own people. Yeah, uh, and he became the arbiter who was responsible for dealing with disagreements between the different factions of Sangheili. Um, while they're driving. They're stopped at a checkpoint by Cortanya's minions called, and this is a this is a a, a word I I had to look up, and then I, when I first searched it, you know what the first thing that came up? So the word is armager. Uh huh. And when you search armager, there's mm -hmm. the definition, 
And then there's Warhammer 40K stuff. Ah, yes. <laughs> of course there is. If you find an old word that used to be like a Roman term for military whatevers, but you're right. Holy shit. You put an armature and hit the image search and it is, I'm going down the page and I, ha okay, there's one thing here for Raid Shadow Legends that is not 40K. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit, that's hilarious. Yeah, okay, they have, they have, uh, Games Workshop has good and rightly just taken that word. Just Holy taken cow. that, you know? If it's, wow. It's like, they made that word up. And like, yeah. Oh, no, it's an old word. They didn't. Yep. Um, I love that shit. That's hilarious. That's, you know, uh, an old TSR guy using throwing <laughs> that word in there. It makes sense, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> Talk about that at the next TSR versus Games Workshop I, softball game. I've read, I've read about how I've read about how <laughs> Gary Gygax had this book, this old book full of words that just weren't used anymore. That was the whole point of the book. It was like one of these novelty books, and it was and it was like words that had lost usage had gone, and that's where so many of these words that he chose from uh, chose that have now in geek communities become actual words again. Uh, you know, and he found orc and shit like that. It's it's hilarious. I love that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, like uh, who who was using sanguine uh, or sanguinary or or something like that, well, that before? Yeah, before Warhammer. Uh, before, <laughs> or Warhammer or Magic the Gathering yep. use use yep. the word a lot. Um, so I love that stuff. That's really fun. Yeah, I, I, I do too. So they're stopped by the armatures. They're basically the cops. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're the MPs. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're the cops that Cortana deploys to these uh, to these cities. And uh, the cops are like, can we talk to you? And uh, there's an entire living complex, like an apartment building or whatever, that was destroyed mm. by some sort of fight. Uh, and the and the armagers are like, what do you know about it? And Evdam's like, I don't know. I, I just got here, man. <laughs> <laughs> and then they take take his and his bodyguards guns and send them on their way yep. <laughs> um it's a really well-written scene it's hard to describe how tense this it's scene tense. actually becomes yeah right <laughs> off the bat you know what it actually made me think of it made me think of 24 yeah uh, it was that level of like just everyone's like looking this way and looking that way someone bites their lip you know and you're just waiting yeah, for the first shot to be fired the dam is with his bodyguards and he's like trying to like communicate to his bodyguards not to do anything right <laughs> <laughs> and the, there's these cops and they're like and they're like all right, we're just going to like take all your guns. They're they're go, they go into the car. They're taking the guns up. There's like guns up on hooks on the wall and then there's like um there's like yeah, and your your energy swords, which are, you know, uh, you know, they have to, classic kind of classic classic elite weapon. Yeah. Um and then the he, he the arbiter's like, oh, "Well, how can I protect myself?" And then the armagers are like, uh, it's no longer your obligation to protect yourself. We are here to protect you. Like, okay. Uh, okay, armatures. <laughs> uh -huh. um, I, I so, believe you. I believe you. Protect yeah. and serve. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Chapter two. Uh, Vadam continues on his way back to his estate uh, while speaking with his bodyguards about the nature of Sanghealy pride, uh, the antagonism that happens in the high council meetings. Uh, and his bodyguards are talking about how they think he has to strike first against the tyrant if he learns of an attack. And there's one point where Vidam is like, he doesn't answer because uh -huh. he's like, I can't say no. If I say no, I'll lose face. And if I say yes, then I'm just dumb. You know? <laughs> like I, he just like remains silent. <laughs> they get back to, back to his place and uh, Vidam's butler basically they, they call him a keep master. So he's basically the butler. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. uh, Kuvadami uh, comes out and meets them at their crav or their car, whatever, uh, and tell, to tell him about a visitor. Uh, Vidam assumes it's Olympia Vale, the Spartan who lives nearby and is a liaison between him and the UNSC. Uh, but it's not. It's an oath warden. And I couldn't stop calling them an oath keeper uh -huh. um, in my yep. head. 
And I'm like, well, where was this guy on January 6th? Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sounded like they, somebody they could have used. He's actually effective. <laughs> so um, he's basically a hitman or mercenary that people hire to make sure that people keep their promises. I love this concept <laughs> so much. <laughs> If you find out somebody, yeah, (laughs) if you find out someone broke an oath, these guys, they're just weirdly traditional. Of course, they get paid for it, but they're also like these weird quasi religious fanatics. Like, but nobody, everybody looks down on like they have, yeah, they have no status. Everybody hates them. (laughs) Yeah, because everyone wants to lie, Kevin, because everyone wants to break their promises. That's why. That's why, yeah. <laughs> World full of dogs, Kevin. <laughs> but yeah, it's such an interesting concept. It really is. It's cool. um, I think that I actually be a neat uh, D&D antagonist. Yeah. Like if you were running a campaign with a, um, uh, with a paladin in it, and mm-hmm. it's a paladin that breaks the oath. And oh, then, that'd be amazing! Wouldn't yeah. that be cool? Like, that would be really cool. Like, yeah. there, you get you get word that the or, the oath warden is coming for you, or something like yeah. that. <laughs> that would be fun. Like, and, and, and it's and, just like a stalker. And I, I've been I've been wanting to run a D and D campaign with like maybe a, a little bit of a stalker enemy, where I'm just doing like silent rolls every time they show up to a town. I'm yeah. just rolling, and if I it hits, it. if it's like over, it has to be like. Uh, over a certain number. So it would start at like 99, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, And it would be like, all right, a 1% chance, right? Right. But every time they go somewhere, the DC on it reduces. Right, right. (laughs) I love it. I think that's great. Yeah, that would be hilarious. I'd love that. I think that would be fun. Yeah. Um, So the Oath Warden. Um, So Vadam meets the Oath Warden in his Grand Hall, which has been totally stripped of any electronics. Uh, Basically, the only way to make sure that Cortana hears nothing is that there's nothing electronic in the entire room. Yes. They have to (laughs) go full Luddite to protect themselves. It has to be a clean room in order for it to work. I mean, it makes sense. It's that, yeah. Uh, They talk a little bit about the... um, he has these installations on the walls that tell the history of his his like ancestors and his his like journey so far through life, the stuff that he's done and uh, and things like that. Um, and uh, the oath warden comes in and lays out his case. Mm. He's looking for someone that was living in that complex that got destroyed. Um, and the d- destruction happened because of confusion between the people that live there. And some Cortana drones and like just gunfight, a gunfight broke out. Mm-hmm. Um, he's looking for a woman named Keely Ayuska, a Xeno archaeologist who was doing work on pre forerunner technology and was hired by the client that he was also hired by. Keely has gone into hiding after taking the money. Basically, she may have discovered a pre forerunner we- weapon that was able to destroy a guardian, yes. which is something that can destroy a planet by itself. I looked up like I looked up uh, Guardian just to see a picture of it. It's one of the things in Halo Five. Um, I don't know why. Whenever I, I I was thinking Guardian, though, the thing that popped into my head was uh, Nimrod. Oh sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're not that far off. He's a little smoother. <laughs> I mean, Nimrod is like. You know, uh, not not the biblical Nimrod, the Marvel one. What yeah, do, duh. What do you think? What do you think, Google? The pink one. Uh, the pink one. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I kept thinking, uh, for some reason, Nimrod kept popping into my head. And I was like, <laughs> I don't know. I like his design. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think, I think it makes sense. I use him in my Marvel Snap deck. Oh, you do? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. He's a good, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. He's a good guy. He's there to good guy that things. Nimrod. Good guy that Nimrod. He's oh, yeah. uh, he's a he's a definitely a villain. Uh, oh yes. <laughs> bad guy. <laughs> v- bad, bad very bad, very bad, bad guy. Bad guy. Bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> um. So basically, Ke- Keely's client would get first pick of whatever she found there, and Vadam realizes, um. That if the client, if the humans got it first, they wouldn't need the Sangheili, and if any of the Kaidons 
were getting it. That means they could con- take control over the rest of the Sangheili. So he's like, okay, so we have to go find this thing. Chapter three, Olympia Vale is at her house and she's been paging Vidam to figure out what's been going on with the Armagers all day. Uh, she also goes through her other contacts, including a human who works at Kolar Manufacturing, which is a Sangheili uh, ship manufacturer. Uh, while she's thinking about this, she notices a transport driving up the road to her house, um, and she gets ready in case it's something dangerous, and the driver throws something out the window and continues on. And it's this little pod thing, and it's a pod that makes a noise to attract, so, like, female Sangheili put it out to attract mates. Yeah, um, yeah. It's an interesting, it's like a little, little, little orgy pod or something. Yeah, like, like it's, it's a I'm in heat and down to clown Charlie Brown pod. It's uh, and an it's interesting a choice. It's a Sangheili thing to hide the identity of the father. Yeah. Or something like that. Um, yeah, you're not supposed to it? find out who your dad is. Right. Um, so I thought that was kind of, kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, anyway, she breaks the pod open because she's like, well... I'm not a Sangheili. <laughs> <laughs> and she finds a matter. She finds a message in it that is that says, open the Sally port. Um, well, and she's like, which well, does like, sound like something that uh, a woman would ask you to do if she wanted you to impregnate her, to be fair. Yeah. Open it right up. Open that Sally port. Open right that Sally port. Up. Um, so feel Jesus. bad about that one. I actually feel. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you should. I should. Um, I, yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> Don't go easy on me. Uh, it's a uh, the Sally Port's a hidden garage door that she has underneath her house that opens out to like the valley side, so like away from the road. Um, so she goes down into her underground garage and opens the door, and outside is Keely, and uh, they were friends with each other when they were younger, uh, and they are very familiar with each other. Oh yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, uh, there's a there's a part at which at one point uh, I think it's it's a Olympia who says, "Well, you're not here to make out, so what is it?" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, take, they take that subtext and make it text. They make it text. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, but yeah, um, Keely had not seen Olympia since she went through her augmentations um, for the Spartan program. So I thought that she, was a really cool touch. Like she's shocked by. She's size. shocked by it because yeah. like, so Ke- so Olympia was like five, five, uh, when she knew her and now is like six foot nine. Right. <laughs> it's a giant, <laughs> an actual literal giant. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, you know, there, there's like some old childhood bullshit between them where, uh, where Keely calls her Pia. Um, which Olympia is yeah. like, I haven't got, I haven't been called by that in years. Stop calling me that. Stop calling me that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, someone's, oh, someone's a little testy. Someone doesn't like that name. At one Ooh. point, Keely s- slips and calls her Pia again. And Olympia is <laughs> like, it says like Olympia lets it slide. <laughs> yeah. Eventually she just drops. She's like, Fine, whatever. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a neat little scene. Um, uh, uh, so Keely feels fills Olympia in on the details about the weapon, and she's assuming uh, that it's on the planet Enba or Nesca or Netherop, all the same planet. It all has the three different. It has three different names depending on who you're asking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but first, they need to travel to Gao, the planet Gao, to find someone. Um, chapter four. Vadam and his ships are already at the planet. He's yeah. left his bodyguards and butler back on Sang Helios with instructions to show themselves often to make it seem like he's still there. Uh, Vadam has some contemplative moments in this chapter, thinking about how brilliant Cortana once was and how she ultimately became the tyrant that she is today. Mm-hmm. Uh, Vadam meets the other Kaidon he requests to join him in the ma- mess hall. So there's Talit, who is this like old crotchety old man and misogynist uh-huh. who uh, are there saying Healy misogynists you bet there are you bet your ass there are in a, <laughs> in a world with uh with little orgy fuck pods you bet there are some misogynists you bet there is those guys still somehow get rejected by them Sanjili <laughs> incels that's all there is to it 
um, and then uh, Ola BC, who is a badass woman who basically like she like saved an entire planet by herself and and then then took that group and she she colonized a, a uninhabited planet and the planet is named after her. Uh, <laughs> it's like he's like, oh, this because so at one point Talent's like, oh, this this woman is here. Yeah. Uh, and I guess she's a Kaidon and and Vadam's like, she's a high Kaidon. Like, yeah, <laughs> she's the governor of her own planet. Shut the fuck up, old yeah, man. Ba- basically <laughs> tells him to get his fucking shine box. <laughs> It's pretty amazing. <laughs> oh, God. Um, yeah, so uh, they have these debates back and forth about what are the merits of actually being here? Does the tyrant already know we're here? Um, but they do realize one thing is the tyrant feel the tyrant fears Keeley in, uh, specifically for some reason. Mm-hmm. Like, like Cortana should know everything that Keeley knows. So why would Cortana be afraid of one human xenoarchaeologist figuring it all out? Right. Um, meanwhile, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're on the planet Gao with Olympia and Keeley, and they're landing. Uh, they're taking a helicopter uh, to land outside of a small settlement. Um, they're looking for someone who can guide them on Netherop, and the settlement is made of people who used to live there years ago uh, before the UNSC evacuated them to Gao. Um, this is an awesome moment. So there's these there's these guys who are just kind of like hanging outside, um, and Vale walks up to one of them and is like, neat gun, can I look at it? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and just like grabs it. And she rips it out of his hands and then she like she checks it and she completely disassembles it in front of him (laughs) to look at each of the parts and then like reassembles it. And she's like, this is going to point at 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 us at any time, is it? And he's like, no. (laughs) (laughs) And And I love that she's not being sarcastic. She's like, look. I really did just want to look at your gun. I haven't seen one of those in a while or something like that. It's right. just, she wants yeah. to talk shop and everyone's treating her like a bitch. It's hilarious. Right. Yeah. And then they, re- they mentioned that they have money to hire somebody and that's when things get a little testy. Uh-huh. And because, uh, the guy that she's talking to like signals something. And at that moment, Vale, uh, grabs the gun and shoves him into a built like inside of a building and her and Keely, like Keely follows them in and they close the door. And, um, he's like, he's like, what are you doing? You, you're all surrounded now. What are you, yeah. what are you going to do? And then the woman that they actually came to see, her name is, uh, Fuertes comes down from the second floor and she's like, you idiot. <laughs> ha- look at her. Do you think they don't they need the armor to fight? And right. he like puts he finally puts together that Olympia is a Spartan. Right. Right. <laughs> she looks like she plays for the Bulls. So let's just uh She can just rip your head off right. if she wanted to. <laughs> Good Lord. Um so the uh, Fuertes uh, was kind of the person in charge of the village that they uh, that was on Netherop, um, and she's de facto in charge now. Um, she's the person that they were looking for that they were going to pay to. They were going to hire. The problem is she has a she's contracted some sort of prion disease, mm-hmm. um, and prions tend to be it's something like uh, your like proteins begin misfolding, yeah, and st- it's like a brain wasting type of thing. It, it's um, like this really interesting detail that you have to wonder. Like it, it, he he Dennings goes into some really interesting detail on this one thing where you could have just, it could have just been anything. It could have been cancer or whatever. And, and and right. It's, and I wonder how much of this is going to play out as important later. Or if this is just, he was like, yeah, let's give her a weird sci-fi brain. Let's give it a weird, a weird. Yeah. It's a weird thing. Um, 
And it's a thing you can have happen to you. Oh you shit! Can, I thought. See, I'm an asshole. I thought they meant that you can. You can. <laughs> Such an asshole. <laughs> I mean, it's, that's the thing. Is it sounds sci-fi? Um, uh, it's the term prions refers to abnormal pathogenic agents that are transmissible and induce abnormal folding of specific normal st- cellular proteins called prion proteins that are most uh, found abundantly in the brain. See. Um, that's that's the sign of a good writer. Take <laughs> take something so that's like something totally that caught, yeah. <laughs> it's, so it's something real, but it's like oh yeah, she contracted this, and it's like it it's just life gets worse for you gradually right, as right. you as you have this thing. Um, basically, uh, so they negotiate, and Fortes is like, I'm gonna die anyway, uh, but you leave the money for for this village, and I'll come with you. Yeah, and that's what they all agree on. Um, chapter six, uh, farther out in the solar system, uh, is, uh, is Atriox's fleet of the banished. Um, and they're a former covenant military group. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and they're just watching shit from afar. Like these are the same guys that we got to see in, uh, the last, uh, in Kelly Gay's Halo book. Yeah. The yes, banished. Yes. Yes. Right. They cool. were banished. Yep. Um, it's basically, so, like, the covenant dissolved. Yeah. And then the people who were still militaristic and still wanted to fight the war, even though the it's, like, basically the entire, you know, the, the entire purpose of the covenant was perpetuated by this big lie, right? Yes, yes. And once that was exposed, the covenant fell apart. Uh, but the banished are still together because they're, you know... The South will rise again, I guess. Yeah, yeah, they really are the the, the adherents of the lost cause. That's that's essentially what they are. Yeah, yeah, good call. <laughs> um, so they're watching the Arbiter's group from afar using some sort of holographic technology to hide their presence. Um, and Atriox is speaking with Salju, who is the one who hired Keeley to find the artifact that can kill the Guardians. Uh, and Salju also hired the Oath Warden to find Keeley. Uh, which is what kicked this whole thing off. Um, and he knows a lot. He already knows that there is a weapon on this planet that can uh, destroy Guardians just based on his own preliminary research. Mm-hmm. Um, but he needed somebody who was more familiar with this stuff, who's an expert. And there's not a, that's the thing they kind of make clear. There aren't a ton of experts in pre forerunner alien technology yeah like uh, how could Keely's there be the, keely is the only one who has kind of like spent time studying it and she's a professor she's a professor at the university of edinburgh uh edinburgh um to like teach that stuff yeah. um but and th- actually i'll pause that was actually a fun side discussion that i kind of like skipped over but keely and olympia talking about academia Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's snappy dialogue. It's yeah, really it's, snappy dialogue. Basically, yeah. Keely Keely needed the money because the ONI couldn't do it. That's why she mm-hmm. took the money in the first place. Yeah. I should have I should have made that clear. But also, like she couldn't like she couldn't use the university. Like the university wasn't going to pay her to do this. Right, <laughs> um, right. So. <laughs> she's just she's just burning bridges left and right to get to this thing. Yeah. Um, at the end of the chapter, there's a Tau signature, which means the UNSC has now arrived. Mm-hmm. Um, and chapter seven, uh, Vidam and company have landed on a crater by a tell, which I had to look this up because I wasn't a hundred percent sure. Um, so, and I was like, oh wait, tell Aviv, wait a minute. And then I, I was like, tell is a mound. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a hill. But oh, it's it's like okay. one of those one of those places that's been constructed. It's a mound that's been constructed as opposed to like a natural forming one. I did I didn't put that together. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Um I thought that was also sci-fi. No. Uh, more sci-fi words. <laughs> more more uh, fake bullshit. Uh I mean like tell Latin mound <laughs> for cer- ceremonial purposes. Okay. <laughs> I'm over here like 
Homer Simpson being like, you don't eat, you don't eat bacon. You don't eat pork. You don't eat ham. Dad, those all come from the same animal. Surely it's a, a magic animal. <laughs> That's that's what that's what this entire first third of the book has been for me, and I'm like, oh, that's not real. That's a thing that Troy Denning came up with. It's like, no, that's he invented it. Yes, of course. Space, space, of course, is nonsense. Uh, uh, what's a gime? <laughs> oh, a gime. Uh, I see. <laughs> I always quote that in my head every time somebody says the word Jim. And it's one of the only jokes. It's like a joke from The Simpsons that doesn't work without the visual reference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. With the fact that he's he sees the sign Jim and says, "What's a gime?" and walks in, <laughs> sees people walking out, and then says, "Oh, a gime." <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that one. Oh man. Uh, so they're down there and. Uh, They're really preoccupied with some weird mirage shit that's going on off on the horizon. They're watching a shape slowly grow larger uh, off in the distance, and they're not sure is it coming towards them or not. Um, There's just a lot of discussion about whether it's a real thing. Is it a trick of the eye? Is there a thing coming at us that we and we don't know what it is? What is going on here? And it's like, I like, love this scene so I much. I love this moment. It's such a weird moment because they're like, I don't know what the fuck is going on. Yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> and I kept stopping and second guessing myself because they're as confused as we are. And I, and I was like, am I, is, am I meant to know what's going on? I have no idea. What, and, and it was, no. it was, but no, we're, we're, we are meant to know. No one's zilch. meant to know what's going on. No one At knows what. It's great. He's like, <laughs> he's like, you come here. And they're the, like, one of the people comes down and like puts a telescope and, uh, and they're like, yeah, it sure is a fucking thing coming yeah. towards us. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so great because they're so out of their element. It, it's just nobody on this, this planet, planet is doing yeah, well. This planet is so alien. It's yeah. hot. It's uncomfortable. It's rocky. There's a thing off There's on the horizon. Thing, and it might be getting closer. I don't know. <laughs> I I love it. It's such a strange way to to, to basically introduce this whole the new water's setting. changing colors. What's going on here? Dogs and cats living together. Total Mass hysteria. hysteria. <laughs> it's great. It's great. Oh gosh. Um so he's like, all right, just send some ships to go that way and look at it. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there's, like, some scuffling happening. And then the ships, like, fly overhead, but they're flying all weird. And he's like, what's going on there? And they're like, wait a minute. Those are humans in that ship. And um, he's like, it's not, it's not the UNSC because they haven't landed yet. Mm-hmm. So these, these are humans that have... And then he like he like has like a brain explode like yeah like, yeah <laughs> he, he realizes that that these are humans that have been marooned on these plant on this planet for like thirty years yeah since the war <laughs> ended since before the war ended since before here's the thing it was even before the events of the first oh, Halo right. game <laughs> right that's right that's right. <laughs> These are these are the these are the Halo equivalent of that one Japanese guy in the jungle who thought that the war was still going on and was exactly. just living it. That's it's crazy because that was another moment I was like, wait, who are they? What the fuck is going on? It's just chaos. It's great. <laughs> it's just chaos. It's like, so good. Everybody is rushing. That's the thing I love about this story so far is every one of the characters is rushing to figure something out yes. before the other group figures it out or before Cortana realizes that people are trying to figure out. But they're going so fast that they're not really taking the time to check the fact that there's weird other shit happening. <laughs> yeah. I love there's this there's a they're like they're they're riding these hum, there's humans and those ghosts. And he said, "Well, what happened to the pilots? They're dead, sir." What? Yeah, they've been decapitated, sir. What? <laughs> <laughs> what ha- what happened to the phantom? They're in the phantom. <laughs> <laughs> It's who, like, did who with a what now? It's, <laughs> Just, like, it's, it's like, well, I'm going to the Phantom. Like, you can't. The, the door is closing. 
What do you mean the door is closing? Yeah, they went into the Phantom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're going to tell me that malnourished, basically feral humans have stolen our ships. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Sick. That's great. And he's like, he's like, these are... When he, he puts it all together, it's like, yeah, these are going to be really hard to kill people. Um, <laughs> He's like, these people have been here for 30 years, so they're good at what they do. They're, so They're tough as nails. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, they see like, there's like a couple of their, of their people, like at the entrance of a cave who just mysteriously disappear um, and, and Vadam and the Oath Warden are like there. So they start running into the cave and, uh, they run into a woman and her two sons, I assume. Mm-hmm. Um, I, yeah, I, I, they did, I don't know if they ever get into it at this point, but I, but they, I they were too. born on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cause they're teenagers. They're, yeah, yeah they're young. So she's a former UNSC commander who still thinks that the war is going on. And Vadam is like trying to explain to her that the war has been over for a while now. And I'm, I'm reading this scene and he's like, and I'm like, I'm t- I'm like looking at it from Vadam's point of view of like, Oh buddy, you have no point. You have no, you have nowhere to start with them. Yeah. No, <laughs> you're just, you're just you the enemy. Even- you can't even tell them about the halos. They don't know what those are. Right. Yeah. <laughs> they haven't He's even like, played Combat Evolved yet, motherfucker. <laughs> it's, it, yeah. I just imagine Vadam just sitting there like, all right, what do you know? Yeah. And- so, yeah. <laughs> Just imagine Vadam being like, first the earth cooled, and then the dinosaurs came. But they got too big and fat, and so they all died and turned into oil. <laughs> uh, sit in my lap, little boy. I'm going to tell you about the history of the world. <laughs> I like movies with gladiators in them. Uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Vadam and Hor- the Vadam and Horvath Christmas special. <laughs> yeah, we've got. Oh my gosh! Oh Vidam my gosh! and Horvath explain Christianity. Yeah, <laughs> in broken English. <laughs> um. So, uh, she uh, she's like attempts to kill Vadam, and then the Oath Warden has like basically Boba Fett tricks at this point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Where he just like <laughs> he has like a he has like a thing in his wrist that he just holds up and sprays in her face. Yeah. Uh, and it's a drug that it, it's like a truth serum drug that he yeah. sprayed in her face. <laughs> um yeah, Oath, it's he's basically a bounty hunter for he all really intents is. and purposes. He's basically and, like a Boba Fett type character. And it's hilarious because Phantom's <laughs> like, What what did you do? And the Oath Keeper's like basically he's like, he's like, What? What? What have I done? What? What's wrong? What have I done? She's still so, alive. She's I fine. Didn't kill her. I kept the peace. <laughs> I kept the peace. And yeah. she's still she's gonna talk more now. Yeah. And, and Vadam's like, You drugged her? Yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, Well, you know. You, you didn't want me to kill her, so um, she'll talk now. Yeah. And Vidam's like, Ugh. what? <laughs> he hates it. He hates the fact that he did this. But he's like, well, I'm not going to let this go to waste. But that's um, just it. It's like this really great, like, I hate that he's right kind of moment. He's like, yeah, yeah this is probably going to help. So Vidam's <laughs> like, all right, tell us what you know. And and the Oath Keeper's like, uh, uh, Oath Warden. Oath Warden, I did it too. I did it too. <laughs> the Oath Warden's like, nope, don't say anything. Just watch. And it's like, whatever the drug is, it makes her want to talk. So it's cocaine. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> it's good cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> she just wants to tell him everything. She's like, mm. and he's like, he's not, uh, she's not going to be real, able to resist talking. No. <laughs> and she's she going to say something. So just wait like, for it. She's like, okay, uh, the thing you saw, that's uh, that's called a runner, and uh, you're you're near the citadel, and then you're gonna want to take cover because uh, ship shit starts falling out of the sky. Yeah. Um, he's like, there's a drop ship, uh, but it's not it's not coming down pretty. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as we'll find out in the next chapter. Um, so yeah, everybody has to take cover, and we're in chapter eight. Yes. 
Uh, back up on the UNSC ship, they're hovering over the same tell that Keeley has identified as the most likely location. Everybody basically is coming in. We're, it's yeah. going to be a meeting of the minds here. Everybody's here. Everybody's here. Everybody's partying. Um, and it's like, what's funny is like, it took, it didn't take them any time at all. Cause they have Keely. Keely's like, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Like Vadam, it took them like a week to figure it out, like with topographical scans and all that stuff to figure out where to land. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Keely's identified as the most likely location. Keely and Vale are discussing how they're going to get down there and, uh, how they're going to convince the Sangheili that they have claim over the dig and, Vale's like, well, I could try to say that it's a human planet because we humans like the only time it's been settled recently were humans. Yeah. And Keely's like, yeah, I'm sure that'll work. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm sure they'll go. They'll go right we'll go for, for that. that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. That'll be fine. Um, but they do have a full unit of ODSTs to help them with the dig. And I'm sure glad we got those ODSTs. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. They're going to be great, right? They're, they're going to be great. Today. Yeah. I wonder why we're not meeting of them, any of them right now. Huh. Um, hmm. Suddenly, the camera of the ship passes over the tell while Olympia is looking at the the monitor, and she has a hallucination, sort of, I guess, of life and the creation of the universe and stars. And she's feel it feels like she's there for looking at it for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and then it stops. And when the camera moves past that spot. So uh, she's like, what? Uh Uh-huh. And then Fuertes is like, you saw it too, right? I thought it was another one of my seizures. Yeah, 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 I love it. I was like, oh, okay. So that was, okay, that wasn't just me. (laughs) No, the mind knife? No, we all see it. We all saw it. We all saw it, yeah. Yeah. So then Vale notices a bunch of contacts on the ground, seemingly fleeing the area. So I I think in in this moment, what they're seeing is like the chase between the Sangheili and the marooned humans and all Mm -hmm. that. Like shit's just going back and forth. Yeah. Um, So she hops onto the nose camera and to take a look and the camera again catches that spot on the tell and the uh, the universe uh, starts happening again all at once. <laughs> yes. That's the best way of putting it. The universe starts happening. <laughs> the universe starts happening. Yeah. And that's, that's literally what happens in the book. She's like, she's like in a mo- in an instant, she sees everything like the life of the, of the, the entire lifespan of the universe happens in her eyes and this moment. But this time, it also happens to fry the ship's electronics. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> and the ship starts falling through the atmosphere. Um, as they get down, the pilot is able to stabilize the ship before they crash, like 45 meters before they hit the ground. Uh-huh. Uh, the pilot is able to stabilize and pull back up. And the pilot's like, yeah, I guess we're done here, right? And Vale's like, no, we found our, our insertion point. And the pilot's like, inserting with what, yeah. ma'am? And she, she, the ODSTs are gone. And she's yeah. like, what do you mean? And he's like, look. And the OD, the thing that's carrying the ODSTs was just like vaporized. Yeah. Just, the ODSTs are just gone. Yeah. Just they, they, <laughs> they, they have ceased to be. <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah. I wonder, I was, yeah. I, and I did seriously think, well, what, I love the ODSTs. I wonder why we haven't gotten to know any of them oh oh i see (laughs) i thought we would give a few of them names oh okay so so far (laughs) just if anybody's keeping uh track of casualties uh that was seven of the dam's people were killed by the marooned humans and 40 odsts (laughs) were killed by the birth of the universe yeah (laughs) yeah By space baby. By space baby. <laughs> yeah, it just, just reaches out and slaps them out of existence. Um, and Vale's like, well, we're going to land anyway, because I think I, I think we found what we're looking for. <laughs> yeah. I think, okay. 
<laughs> and, and that's where we're leaving it for today's episode. Oh my so, god! So, Phil, you've already—I mean, you've already said you like the book, but like, yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts so far? I this is great writing. It's great writing. It's uh, you know where Kelly Gay uh, took us with the Rubicon Protocol uh, took us into this. Super gritty war story. Gritty, yeah, nom kind of like experience. Uh, it's just as you said, you know, uh, Troy here is getting us into um, political thriller and espionage and, and uh, you know, the tension is really high. The stakes are high. It's uh, it's very much a what was the, which one was the uh, the Star Wars movie that was based on getting the the plans? Oh, of Rogue the, One. It's it a feels... very Rogue One kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And uh, and he's got a lot of characters in here, but he has kept up with them very very well. I love it. I'm really enjoying it so far. Yeah, all the characters are are pretty well fleshed out. Um, yeah. Uh, and I think he does an amazing job of explaining things as as we're on the run um, in a way that, like, I am not a Halo game, you know, fanatic. I've sure. played the first one, and I think I've played and beaten the first one and Reach. Yeah. yeah. I think that's it for me. I um, think that's it for me as well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Yeah, I, I, I think he does a really good job explaining what you need to know about each of these characters and how they kind of fit in with the Halo, wider Halo universe yeah. uh, as we're going. Uh, but yeah, I love the tension. Every chapter has something in it that's just weird and tense. And and even the uh, the chapter with where we introduce Olympia Vale... Um, there was like a moment of tension with the driver. Like she thought the driver was throwing a grenade at her. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for a second. <laughs> it's these little details that she, didn't she's have worried to be it was there. a hit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It just keeps you on edge at all times. It's great. It's great. Um, and you know, everything is like everything is so tense because like you you can't you know, uh, what's it? Uh, the, the arbiter, like he's off world right now. He's not supposed to be off world. Right. Like, like Cortana's for forbidden it from, <laughs> from, you know, uh, traveling without like notifying her staff or whatever, one of the AIs. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, that's, uh, I really like it. Yeah. I like, uh, I like all the, the stuff. I like that it's from, a lot of it has been from the point of view of uh, Thelvin Am, who uh, is kind of like he's kind of like the 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 master chief of the Covenant in a yeah. way. Yeah, the, uh, y y I remember when you texted me about that, and I hadn't thought about it like that. But yeah, I, I, I yeah, uh, you're totally right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like in a way, yeah, because he was like. He was the one who he was the one who gave the the order to Glass Reach, for yep. example. Uh, he was the one that chased them to to uh, the first Halo. Um, if I'm wrong on that lore, I think I I think that's right though. Um, I think you're right. Yeah, he's just a very he's he he and Master Chief are both responsible for countless numbers of deaths on the other side. <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> they are they are both genocidal maniacs, and we're pulling for them. We're pulling for them. <laughs> Bel Vadam at one point mentions that he's killed billion. He's responsible for the death of billions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know. Um, He's on the good guys now. So uh, yeah, he's, really... he's 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 so weirdly reasonable. Like he isn't right. this he isn't this lost cause kind of guy. Like when he's very patient with the the humans who don't know the war is over, and like he doesn't want to hurt them, and he's very insistent on like we were following a lie, and and now it's over, and we are allies now, and and, he, and it's just like wow, like that's. <laughs> He is yes, a very yes. pragmatic yeah. and understanding character. I killed entire planets of your people, but that's behind us now. That's <laughs> it's all behind us now. It is kind of <laughs> conflicting, isn't it? It's it is like, a little <laughs> bit because, like, in any other setting, you'd be like, well, you know, war crimes. Um, right, right, exactly. We're, we're, we're committed, Phil. Jeez. Um, uh, huh? 
Like the glassing, that was totally optional on your guys' right, part. Yeah, you yeah. Have I have to understand to... why. <laughs> war people is would be war. Upset. Genocide is genocide, my friend. Yeah. It's, so yeah. <laughs> still, you like, still, I like them. Yeah, uh, oh yeah. Yeah, I know. I can't help it. It's so weird. Despite despite that that disconnect on what he's done and where his character <laughs> is now. Um, it's so, so strange. Yeah. No, it, it is strange. Um, you know what else is strange? What's that? What are you playing? Oh, oh, okay. Well, um, so I played Aliens Dark Descent again. Uh, <laughs> I, again. I finished it again uh, because I got an itch. Uh, it's, it's, I gotta say, man, it's one of the fastest times I've gotten an itch for a game after I'd finished it. Uh, they have indeed cleaned it up quite a bit. Okay. Uh, there are there were fewer, uh, if any, game breaking issues that I ran into. There are still there's still some middling kind of like indie uh, uh, jank, uh, right? But it's focused, so you're just going to deal with that, and that's just that's always going to be there. And this is such a um, what's the word? They're they're trying for something big. Uh, Ambitious. Mm. It's an amb- ambitious, ambitious ambition. Th- th- yeah. yeah, like th- th- to to follow that XCOM format into the real time strategy format. Uh, the way that they did is such an ambitious move. Uh, and frankly, when you look at XCOM two and and you know the more recent XComs, they are filled with even more bugs uh, than this game is. So I I, I was right. frustrated before, but I'm I'm, I'm I, I think I've gotten over it for the most part. It really right. is just a, a solid game. Uh, I wasn't thrilled with the way it came out initially, and I still think that fucking games need to come out in a in a finished right uh, in a finished s- a state. Um, but now that it's now that it's done, I'm willing to forgive and forget because I, I really did love it both times um and then i also finished pokemon arceus okay Uh, only the second pokemon game i've ever played uh very different from all the other pokemons because it's kind of like this weird open world uh, almost action rpg kind of thing uh i i was i enjoyed my time but i noticed that i beat it without realizing i beat it so that might have something (laughs) I was literally sitting there one afternoon with my wife and we were just having some lunch and dicking around and, and I was playing on my my, my uh, Switch and i doing some boss battle and I finished the boss battle and I put the Switch down to go refill my drink or something like that and when I got back the credits were rolling and I went, oh shit, I beat the game. <laughs> oh, so, okay. So, so yeah, I, I, I mean... I think that'll probably keep me satisfied uh, with Pokemon for another 10 years, because the last one I played was about 10 years ago. Right. Yeah. So I think we're good. Um, yeah. And in a more recent uh, thing, I, I, I played a little bit of Gravity Circuit. Okay. Now, Gravity Circuit is kind of this. It's, you look at it, and you're like, oh, this is Mega Man. Uh, and there's no question. They're, they're, trying to do, <laughs> they're trying to do a Mega Man X kind of thing with a little right. Bionic Commando thrown in, which had me intrigued. Right. Um, it's fun. It's goofy. I'm not going to play any more of it. Uh, it <laughs> I, just, I, I, I found that I was just kind of exhausted already by the first yeah, level. Yeah. I was just like, I don't know if it was the mood I was in or what, but like, if you guys like the sound of a new... Uh, Mega Man X style game or something. It it looks beautiful. The music's great. Uh, the controls were. I didn't care for the controls, but you could totally remap them. Uh, so there's no that's there's no excuse there. Um, I just feel like I think the more most interesting thing about it is instead of or at least up to the point that I was playing, instead of it being a shooty kind of thing, you're actually a melee robot. So you're uh, okay. beat them up, and that's kind of cool. But I found that after. Isn't a, it is? It's not your bag. It just it just didn't keep me. I wasn't. Go, I was like, I'm not gonna finish this. Uh, uh, so I, I, I. But but if that sounds interesting, it it looks very cool. It looks like someone would really really enjoy it. So that's Gravity Circuit. All right. Uh, what about you, Kevin? What do you play this week? Let's see. Let's open up my Steam. <laughs> um, did I talk about that? Uh, I think I did. I played I played a bit of Trepang too. Um, I think I talked about that 
Did last you? Last week. Um, I might have. If not, it's a it's a shooter. Um, it's a first person shooter. Very very gory. Um, oh okay. A lot of fun. It's actually. Um, it's like. How, how do I put this? It's it's like you're John Wick with some superpowers. Okay. Um, and you can go into bullet time, and you can make yourself invisible, and it's a lot of fun. Um, almost all the time, like you'll be fighting in a dark area, and like the enemy guys will like throw a flare, so everything is red already. And mm-hmm. then you're shooting these guys and they're blowing up and it's just like it just seems like this this like smoky, cloudy, red room of blood and guts as as you're tearing down these guys. It's it's pretty cool. That um, sounds cool. It's uh, high, fast pace um, and uh, and uh, a lot of fun. I haven't put a ton of time into it, but uh, I beat like the first level. Um, nice. Let's see. What else have I been playing? Uh, I have been playing some early access Baldur's Gate three. Oh yes, okay. Let's let's have it. Let's have it. It's very good. <laughs> God um, damn it! <laughs> lie to me, Kevin. Lie. It's it's terrible. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> so the early access doesn't have you can't like go everywhere in the like you'll get to points of the map where it's like whoa they are partner. <laughs> that you can't get past that point without uh, an early access, so you're just gonna have to wait. Uh, um, okay. So, yeah, the basic setup of the game is that you were alien abducted by some um, some mind flayers, and you got a mind flayer tadpole put into your eye, which is apparently how mind flayers reproduce. Yep. Um, they put the tadpole in your eye, and after a few days, you become a mind flayer. Um, so that happens to your character, uh, and while you're on this mind flayer ship, they get attacked by uh, what are they called? The Kithic or something like that. Um, oh, uh, Kithic? Yeah. Hold on, let me see. The, they're the ones. They're the dragon rider people that look like. They're like goblins, but sexier and taller. Oh, I don't know. That I don't know. I'm the uh, dragon. Uh, hold on. I'm going to look this up. Dragon Rider uh, D&D Green Skin uh, Why am I not... Why am I not seeing? It? I don't want image search. I just want. I just want all. <laughs> just, just tell me things. Just tell me things. Um, anyway, they're like these green. Uh, oh, the the Gith Yankee. Oh, Gith Yankee. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're they're like sexy goblins. Um, <laughs> the at least in this goblins. one, they're made to they they're made to look uh, a little bit hotter than they do in sure. in some of the official D and D arc art. <laughs> where they're like more ghoulish looking um uh because there's like a there's like a gith yankee who's like one of the main characters nice um anyway um yeah they are um the gith yankee attack the mind flayer ship and it goes down and it goes down hard uh it crash lands and basically you're out now you're you're just you've landed the ship has crashed uh, and you're just by yourself and you start wandering around and you start like finding other party members who were also people that were on the ship. Um, so you like find a, find a woman who is, uh, you find a cleric who is like banging on a door to a, um, to a, a church or something like that. And she's like, yeah, I was on the ship. You know, you want to try to figure this out together. All right. Mm. It's a lot of fun. Um, and it has real-time mode and turn-based mode. Um, anytime, like a trap, uh, like a trap, op- like activates, it goes into turn-based mode, so you can like react to it. And the first time this happened to me, I was like, "Why is it in turn-based mode? There's no enemies. Go back to real-time mode." And I, clicked, <laughs> I switched back to real-time mode, and then the room got set on fire, and I oh, died. And I, like, I oh. see. They were giving me a chance to like react to the facts that they really it's... didn't want you to die, uh, but okay. 
<laughs> so it's a lot of fun, uh, hard as balls. Okay. Um, especially when you're starting out your character as a level one. Uh, you're le- just a level one with 10 hit points. You run That's into crazy. like literally anybody. Like just literally anybody with like a level that's like level three you like you'll find a, a group of of uh people like treasure uh treasure hunters yeah. in this one part and they're all like level three oh, for fuck's and there's sake. like there's like 10 of them and there's two of you and it's like oh Okay, oh. yeah, I'm not supposed to fight these people right now. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to turn around and, oh, I've been caught. <laughs> I, I am dead. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I like it. I'm I'm really looking forward to its final release, which actually will be, it's already out probably when this episode comes out. Okay, I was about um, to say it's soon. It's, it's yeah. next, as of recording, it's next week. Um, but it will be, ha- it will have been the week before this episode. Um, the prior week, I think. I think it's August 3rd. Nice. Um, so, yeah. Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, what else? More fear and hunger, because I hate myself. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, yeah, that's yeah, that goes without saying. Um, and I'm looking forward to Armored Core 6, Fires of Rubicon, because some of the gameplay on that just looks so much fun. That looks really cool. It looks really <laughs> cool. I'm frustrated with how cool it looks. <laughs> you're in a mech, Phil. I know. And you're flying around and shooting oh, things. <laughs> I just, I know that that game isn't for me. I just know it's not for me. And, <laughs> and, but it looks cool. And I just know I'm going to buy it. Uh, I just, I'm nervous. Ripley, for God's sake. This will just open the door for you to getting into like painting Gundams. I mean, I do, I do have Gundams, so <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't watch any of the anime or read them. I just like putting to. I, I like the idea of building action figures. I really sure. enjoy that. Um, sure. So, and I just happen to enjoy their design, so I just buy them without thought of anything about their background. I just put them together. It's, it's super fun. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, but that's that's what I've been playing, and uh, that's where we'll leave it for tonight, everybody. Um, so if you can, follow us on uh, Threads. Um, yes. <laughs> yes, we are officially on Threads, and we have put up the uh, outfishing sign on, on the, on, the horrible on blues, bluebird. <laughs> on, on, on the X. Oh, God. So don't, come don't, find us on what, Threads. Do you not know what X is? Do you not know what... Do you, Oh, I know. I'm I sorry. know it's gonna give it to me. It's um, gonna give it to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's whether you like it or not. Whether uh, you like it or not. So the yeah. dumbest thing ever. Sorry, Elon no. Musk is is so fucking silly. What is the, Twitter was probably the the best thing about Twitter was the its branding. Like you knew what Twitter was. Everybody knew what Twitter was. Yeah. And now it's X. you were fine it's just he's he's not it's like it's kind of like he was like okay all right i'm losing 44 billion dollars so let's just say fuck it and and let's make it fireworks yeah (laughs) just all the way into the ground yeah uh it's such a shame it's such a shame yeah and i i mean i don't have high hopes for threads either no uh, to be honest but we're there i guess we're there for now we're there Uh, until until we can get an invite to to blue sky basically blue sky yeah um (laughs) and uh i'm also i also have us over on on mastodon if you're if you're a dork who enjoys that uh go to uh at pixelit at bookstodon.com that is our mastodon uh account and you can follow us there um Otherwise, go to our website. That's our website and our Patreon and our Discord are probably the safest bets if you want to know what's going on and what we're up to. Go to our website, pixelitpod.com. You can sign up for a newsletter. Uh, go to patreon.com slash pixelitpod where you can follow us there or you can throw us throw us some money. Please. Um, or go to our Discord. Discord. The uh, the link to which is you can get there um, through our website. Or if you're a patron, you'll get automatically slid right into the Discord as well. Um, so yeah, go there, follow us there, 
uh, that's that's the best places to, to keep in touch with us. Um, and that'll do it. Have a good night, everybody. Bye.